Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Monday study group. Welcome to, to Holy Week. Uh, yesterday was Palm Sunday, and uh, by Thursday we'll be at Maundy Thursday, then Good Friday. And then for some Christians, uh, Saturday night begins the Easter Vigil, uh, given that the old calendar, a new day began uh, after sunset. And so some churches, including the one we attend, will have an Easter Vigil service on Saturday night. And then, of course, the celebration of the resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday. I thought I'd begin today with a prayer that was part of the uh, celebration of the Lord's Supper yesterday on Palm Sunday, also called Passion Sunday in some traditions of the Christian faith. So let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So we are uh, in Ecclesiastes in a different world, aren't we? Uh, this is not the world of the first century, and it's certainly not the Christian world of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the new understanding of God's relationship with all humanity that came to us through Jesus Christ. But it is a part of Holy Scripture. And it is a part of the way this author looked at the world in which he lived. And our prayer is also that we might learn from it for ourselves, um, whatever God has given us here that we can use. We ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. All right, so uh, he begins by uh, returning to a subject that he ended chapter 3 with. In chapter 3, verse 16, he was in, in he was concerned about justice, wickedness, unrighteousness in society. Uh, he saw that that kind of thing was happening and it wasn't the way things should be and that he believed God would ultimately judge it. But here he says, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Again, he is looking at it as an outside observer. He is not one who is himself oppressed, but sees the oppressions and is empathic with those who are suffering. Look, the tears of the oppressed, he says in verse 1. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there is power. So there is the oppressed and there are the oppressors. And the difference between them is that one word, power. But the oppressed have, he repeats it, have no one to comfort them. And even though he isn't among those who are either oppressing or oppressed, as he thinks of it. As an outside observer, he is drawn into the suffering of the oppressed, and he notices their tears and their anguish, maybe much as you do when you watch the evening news of what's happening in our world and in many different places. There are more opportunities than we can handle to empathize with the suffering of people throughout the world due to war, uh, due to poverty, due to disease, uh, and a lack of sufficient resources to sustain human life. Our prayer, Lord have mercy, 
is drawn out from us, much as this person in Ecclesiastes notices the suffering of the poor and their tears and the oppressed and and believes that that should not have happened to them. It discourages him so much that when he thinks about it, he thinks that these it would be better if these people had had never even been born. He says, and I thought that the dead who have already died are more fortunate than the living. And he doesn't mean all the living. He means those who are oppressed and suffering under this power differential between the oppressors and the oppressed. These who are suffering and crying in tears are, are less fortunate than those who have already died and who are at rest. And yet, he says, even better than both is the one who has never been born to such a life of suffering and oppression. Better that they had never seen the light of day. This sounds like Job in some places, doesn't it? Uh, when Job cries out that it would have been better if he had never been born. Because of all the evil deeds that are done under the sun. So... We couldn't help but think about it in the group that met this morning to discuss this passage of how uh, often and, and at what depth today you and I are exposed to the suffering of the world in a way that has never been before because of all of the media and technology that enable us, whether we want it or not, to see all the suffering in the world every night on the evening news, every morning if you watch television in the morning. Uh, it's always there. We can always tune in to the suffering in the world. Somebody's got a phone on and is recording that suffering, and the images show up from across the world on our evening news. We become like Koheleth. We become like him, observers of the suffering of the world, observers of the tears of the oppressed. Uh, and, and, we, and we can know about it uh, on a continuous basis every day for the rest of our lives if we choose to do so. In the ancient world, there was no such media or technology that enabled people to see all the suffering that's going on in the world as we can. But what they saw, what Koheleth saw, was enough for him. He saw the oppressed and their suffering and their tears, and it caused him anguish, so much anguish that he said it would have been better if they had never been born. Um, and think that only back then your only way of finding out about the suffering of others was to see it in your own society but also perhaps to hear about it by messenger who came from other places that people had traveled. In, in verse 4 he returns um, to another subject that he has dealt with before. If you're used to studying let's say the letters of Paul or even the narratives of the Gospels, they move in a linear fashion. Paul, when he writes, is often discussing topics in what we would call a linear way, where one thing leads to another, and the, and the, the, the argument or the content uh, is explored and explained in a in a straightforward way in which you can follow the line of the argument that Paul is making or the, or the teaching that he is given. And in the narratives, of course, it's a story. And so the story unfolds from one aspect of the life of Jesus to the next. Uh, and, and we're used to, in reading those parts of the Bible, to see the linear progression of the words and the ideas. Not so here in Ecclesiastes. He's going to loop back to topics throughout the book. He will discuss something, move on, and then loop back to it a little bit <coughs> in, a, in a later passage and continue on 
and several of the topics will recur in, in Ecclesiastes. It's actually quite like James. Uh, the letter of James does the same thing. He will return to topics that he has discussed earlier, loop back to them. It's not a linear epistle. Um, and, of course, James is wisdom literature, and so is Ecclesiastes. And maybe that's one of the typical ways that this letter, that this literature is written, is that it uh, is topical, and that one topic suggests another, but then the third topic suggests the first one again. So there's a kind of looping back to pick up themes. And that's what we have here, the theme of work or toil uh, in, in verse 4. Then I saw all the toil and the skill in work come from one person's envy of another. Now, we disputed that idea in class today. We thought that that's not always the case. So we modified what Ecclesiastes is saying here to say that we saw that some of the toil and some of the skill in human life result from the envy of one person of another and the seeking to top them or one-up them or best them by producing something better or uh, getting more prestige than somebody else for something that you've done. But not all the toil and all the skill that we see in the world comes from one person's envy or jealousy or rivalry with another person. It comes from people wanting to uh, use the gifts and abilities that they've been given. It comes from altruism to some degree, where people do genuinely want to help eat other people. Uh, I'm one who believes that almost always when we do something, our motives are mixed and are often unconscious to us. Some of our motives we're conscious of, and some of them might be good and some might be not so good. But we also have motives that we are unaware of that, that affect us. Um, thinking about how we uh, could never please our fathers. And even though they have been dead for 50 years, we're still trying to please our fathers. Uh, we may not be aware that that's a motive. It may be deep within us and, and we keep acting it out without it being really fully conscious. I, I'm sure there are other such motives. But we, we think that some, at least, of the work and skill that we see in human life is the result of people competing with one another and wanting to one-up one another. And our author here in Ecclesiastes, Koheleth, sees this as vanity. It's part of the human rat race, you could say. Uh, the vanity and chasing after wind that doesn't result in meaning. Other places in Ecclesiastes that we have already covered and will cover, work is seen as a good thing. He's already said it's good to take pleasure in the work that you do. So for him, work can be a good thing, but here he seems so discouraged by all of the oppression and injustice and evil deeds that he sees in the world that his all is uh, hyperbole. Uh, he says all the toil and skill comes from one person's envy or jealousy or competition with somebody else. But I think most of us think that some of it does, but some of it is doesn't come from that kind of motivation. Not all work is produced by by envy or rivalry. Some people just need to work in order to live, to survive, to pay the rent, to put food on the table, uh, to support their family, uh, to help their children in school. Um, these are other motives that we have that don't arise from rivalry or competition uh, or envy of another person. All right. Verses 5 and 6 are proverbs. The question is, are they proverbs that the writer agrees with or disagrees with? 
is he saying these are good things or are they a part of what he considers to be vanity and a chasing after wind? Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Fools fold their hands and consume their own flesh. Now, if you studied this in your commentary, you know that there are different ways of understanding the second half of this verse. Pretty much everyone agrees that the first half of verse 5 refers to somebody simply not working and folding their hands. They're not working, they're not doing anything, they're not writing, they're not making anything. They're just folding their hands. And this author says that they're fools. Fools are usually negative. It seems as if this author, while he appreciates wisdom's limits, he never authorizes foolishness or supports foolishness. So it would seem that fool to be a fool is, is in the eyes of the writer, uh, not a good thing. And fools won't work. They simply fold their hands and as a result, their body wastes away. It consumes itself, basically, until they are nothing and wasting away. Their flesh, as it were, consumes itself. That seems to be the meaning of verse 5. Some people are so lazy, they won't work at all. They're foolish, and they simply destroy themselves in the process of their foolishness and laziness. But what about verse 6? It seems as if 6 begins with the word better, so it means that 6 is better than 5. The description in whatever it is in 6 is going to be better than what is described in verse 5. And so he says, better than this is a handful with quiet. A handful. You've got something. Something you could be satisfied with. And you have quiet. Peace. Better is a handful with quiet than two hands full with toil and, and working and laboring and in order to get what? Well, another handful. Mm, that's vanity and a chasing after wind, he says. That too is meaningless. It won't get you meaning. It won't get you what life is all about. You can work as much as you want and and blame the fool for what happens to him, but you also can be foolish by laboring and laboring and laboring in the other extreme of the foolish, lazy one. The other extreme is the workaholic who works and works and accumulates what? Another handful. That would be one way to understand verse 6 and these two verses as describing two extremes, one of absolute laziness that results in a person's body consuming itself. They won't do anything to ameliorate their situation. And the other extreme of complete workaholism, only to gain another handful that doesn't result in life having more meaning anyway. This too is a chasing after the wind. So he has been observing the lack of meaning in life. And again, I saw vanity under the sun. And this is another instance of his observing something in human life that has led him to find, no, this is not the way to meaning either. And this is the case, verse 8, of the solitary individual. That is, no family, no brothers or sisters, parents or children, or spouse, the solitary, lone individual without family, yet he or she works and works and works and is never satisfied with what they are accumulating and has no one to share it with. They're just alone, completely alone. And the person, you almost hear them crying out in verse 8, crying out. For whom am I working all this work? For whom have I to am I toiling? I have no one. I have no friends. I have no family. I have no brothers or sisters. I have no one to share this with. I'm simply toiling and depriving myself of 
a more pleasant life. I am like the person in verse 6 who toils to gain another handful when he could be resting, enjoying and accepting what he has and having a life of peace and quiet. For whom am I toiling, they ask, and depriving myself of a better life? This also is a vanity and an unhappy business. Our, our author here is seeing in human life so much oppression and injustice and evil and foolishness and laziness and workaholism. He's finding everything that doesn't work, that isn't the way it should be. He's got an ideal in mind, uh, but he isn't seeing that ideal realized in actuality, in reality. This also is a vanity, he says, and an unhappy business. Now, there is a transition, I think, from verse 8 to verse 9, and it has to do with the word toil or work. Uh, we saw toil in verse 6. <clears throat> we saw toil again in verse 8. And it occurs again in verse 9. This is maybe the second famous passage in Ecclesiastes that people quote. The first one, of course, is the one that we read last week about for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time for this and a time for that that song that we heard last week and the words of that uh, poem in chapter 3 is the most famous passage in Ecclesiastes. But this is the second most. This, this one is often read at weddings. Verses 9 to 11 are often read at weddings. Maybe you've heard that, this read. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. There's that theme of work or toil, but here the emphasis seems on a companion, companionship or friendship. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. And he gives you three reasons why. Why are two better than one? Well, the first reason is if one of them falls, the other one is present to lift them up. In the housing area that we live here in, in this senior living community, uh, there are a number of men and women who live alone. If they fall in their house, uh, there is no one there who can help them up. They have to get to their phone or they may have a device that they wear that calls somebody to help them. Uh, we've seen neighbors fall and others come and pick them up. Uh, it's, that's what our author has seen too. He knows that one of the reasons why two is better than one is that if one suffers in some way, like falling, then there's somebody there that can help them and encourage them. Um, today, one of our members' uh, spouse is having a, a first uh, chemotherapy for cancer, and uh, that person's friend was not available to come this morning. His, their spouse... Uh, was not able to be in person at the Monday study group because they went with their partner uh, for that chemotherapy and to be a supportive and a help to them uh, as they went through this uh, trauma, a difficulty, suffering of having cancer and then also trying to address that cancer with the chemotherapy that is not all that pleasant. Two is better than one, because if one suffers or falls, then there's another to lift them up. But woe to the one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. It increases their suffering and makes life much more difficult. Now his second reason why two are better than one is in verse 11. If, if you are alone, how do you keep warm? Uh, a second person, uh, your spouse, uh, a friend, somebody you're camping with, uh, if they're next to you in the tent or in the bed, um, they can increase your warmth so that you don't get so cold. Now, in the Western world, we don't have much trouble with that most places, of course, unless the power goes out, right? Then it really is helpful to have somebody that you can 
cuddle with, hug with, uh, to help keep you warm until the power comes back on again. Our author lives in the ancient world in which there was no such power and, and the fire might go out that you were sleeping near and you, your blankets weren't sufficient for the cold that you were experiencing. And so if two lie together, they can keep warm. How can one person keep warm alone? That's his second reason why two are better than one. His third reason is an enemy. If an enemy comes and opposes you, one might prevail against another. You might be stronger than your enemy, the robber, the uh, thief, the person that you might encounter who uh, is against you in some way, trying to deprive you of life or property or happiness. But if you have a second person with you, you're much more, you're much less likely to be attacked, uh, and and so two is better than one because you can more easily ward off an attack if it happens, or are less likely to be attacked because you have a second person with you and you're less vul vulnerable. Excuse me. So he's got these three reasons why two are better than one and then he ends it with a threefold cord is not quickly broken so i asked the group this morning what's the third and two people immediately said god god's the third and when this is read at weddings that's often the implication that it is better to have a second person in your life a spouse a partner who can be your friend. But to have God as your third partner uh, is even better, and a th threefold cord is stronger than even a twofold relationship. Maybe the third person is God. So our <clears throat> passage concludes with verses 13 through 16. Here we hear a story, it seems to be a story about a poor but wise youth who is better than an old but foolish king, especially a king who will no longer take advice. That's why he's foolish. A poor but wise youth. Usually, wisdom is associated in the Bible with age and foolishness with youth. But here, there's a kind of reversal. We have a youth who is poor but he's wise, and a king who is not wise is foolish. So he's wealthy, not poor, but he's foolish, not wise. A kind of reversal of the situation of the young man. Now, my translation of verse 14 says, one can indeed come out of prison to be a king, to reign, even though born poor in the kingdom. So maybe verse 14 is about the poor youth who was born poor. And one of our uh, members said that the prison is the prison of the womb. Uh, she thought it was symbolic of the womb. Out of the womb, the prison of the womb, the poor one is born to reign. He was born to a poor mother, to a poor family, but he came out of that prison of birth, if this is metaphorical, the prison is metaphorical, of the, of the womb. He was born poor, but he came out of that situation to become a king, even though he was born poor in the kingdom. A, a surprising thing. Usually those who are born into wealth maintain that wealth and it's passed on to their heirs and they reign. We see many examples of that in the Old Testament, that there's a line of kings and the kingship is passed on from one member of the family to the next member of the family. And they don't always handle it well, do they? If you've read the first and second kings stories. So this person who was a poor wise youth, who was better than an old but foolish king, came out of the prison of poverty to reign in the kingdom. But then he says, I saw all the living 
who move about under the sun, who follow that youth who replaced the king. So there was an old and foolish king, but the poor and wise youth became king. And so that, why, that foolish old king was replaced by the youth who was born into poverty but became king. And there was no end to all those people whom he led. Yet those who come later than the second youth who took over the role of being king, there, the one who came later, those who come later don't rejoice in the ones who came before them. There is no memory of the qualities and the goodness of those who ruled before. It seems here that we have a progression or a succession of kings, some of whom came from poverty, some of whom replaced others, and there's a succession of kings and the ones who reigned before are not rejoiced in or they're simply forgotten by those who come after them. Surely this also is vanity and a chasing after wind. You can't even maintain your good reputation as the highest leader of the whole land, the most famous person in the whole land, is forgotten two generations later. Well, that also seems to the writer a vanity and a chasing after wind. Well, as so I sort of predicted last week, even though this chapter is shorter, the video didn't get any shorter, did it? Uh, it's going to run 32 minutes before we're done here. So I hope you have a wonderful Holy Week. I'll see you again on the other side of Easter when we will all be able to say, The Lord is risen! Yes, and you responded, He is risen indeed. I'll see you after Easter. God bless you this week as you meditate on Christ's death and resurrection and participate with your community in celebrating the, the great joy of what Jesus accomplished for us. Thanks be to God.